A poll commissioned by the PNP and published in Tuesday's edition of the Gleuno newspaper shows the opposition party with a sizable lead over the ruling JLP. The poll was conducted by Don Anderson's Market Research Services Limited between April 4 and 12 among persons over the age of 18. It canvassed the views of 1,057 respondents and has a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. It shows that if a general election were called shortly, the PNP would get the support of 36.8% of respondents. The JLP would get the support of 29% of respondents. Those numbers give the PNP a clear lead, 7.8 percentage points, well outside the margin of error. According to the poll, 19.1% of respondents say they are undecided and 15% say they will not vote. Don Anderson says the PNP continues to enjoy strong support from older persons. Notably, he says the PNP and JLP are even when it comes to support in the 18 to 24 age group. He also notes that support for the PNP across both genders is stronger than the JLP. Anderson says 44% of respondents say they would vote for the PNP because the party looks after the poor. Meanwhile, a former PNP politician is dismissing the recent Don Anderson polls published by the Gleader newspaper, which shows the opposition party with an almost 8 percentage point lead over the ruling JLP. Venetia Phillips says the poll findings are part of a time-worn PNP strategy that the public must reject. She made the statement on social media in reaction to the poll results, which were commissioned by the PNP. She also spoke with our news centre. They are no longer credible. You can get what you pay for in a poll. Today, no one can challenge that. As a matter of fact, PNP used to use this internally. It was used in a vicious and savage way. It is something they use when they want to remove candidates who would put up a fight anyway. So this is actually a strategic tool in the toolbox of the PNP. These polls, I wouldn't give any credence to them. This particular one. So rather than spend the money to help to develop people, you waste it on polls to do what? Massage the ego of the leader of the PNP? How sad. The good thing is, in a Jamaica, Tom may look drunk, but Tom ain't no fool. So nobody's giving any credence to this. Miss Phillips says the poll is part of a strategy she saw employed several times by the PNP during her many years as a comrade. I mean, come on, just think about it. It is so odd that a PNP commissioned poll has been run so many times by the Gleaner. And I can tell you why. They're hoping that people will not recognize it to be a PNP poll in order to validate it. But just think about it. I made a wager only yesterday. Yeah, man, I made a bet that the next news item is going to be that PNP or Mark Golding surges ahead. I only just noticed a tweet from Dayton saying the very same thing I made a bet about yesterday. This is a played out strategy by the PNP. And when I say played out, it is so overused. Ms. Phillips says the PNP is concerned about the traction gained by the government in the wake of the implementation of several measures announced in the recent budget debate. She says the polls are intended to help blunt the impact of those budget measures. But look at the stupidity of this particular poll. It is coming when they need a distraction from the fact that what? The 1st of April came in when the salary adjustments, the second part, would have taken effect. So it, it is coming in to coincide with the month end payments. Teachers are feeling a little bit better. Public servants generally, those who have seen a movement in their salaries, they're in a kind of a different mood and mode. You see it all across social media, even from some known comrades, you know. And so what they want to do is detract from that. Venetia Phillips, former PNP councillor for the Papine Division in St. Andrew. Ms. Phillips lost the seat for the JLP at the recent local government elections. Nationwide News understands that Charlton McFarlane has resigned from his role as Chief Executive Officer of the Registrar General's Department, the RGD. Mr. McFarlane is set to leave office on Thursday, May 2. Our sources say McFarlane took the decision to leave now after learning that his contract would not be renewed. In a leaked letter obtained by Nationwide News dated Monday, April 29, 2024, Mr. McFarlane informed the staff of the RGD of the development. In the letter, 
letter, he says he is preparing to start a new chapter in his journey. Charlton McFarlane has served as CEO of the RGD since February 2020. His resignation comes less than a week after the report by the Integrity Commission recommended that he be charged for failing to file his statutory declarations. The Integrity Commission's report was tabled in the House of Representatives last Tuesday. The report says Mr. McFarlane was among four individuals who failed to file statutory declarations for the years 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022. This is a breach of Section 431A of the Integrity Commission Act. Principal Director of the Med Service, Evan Thompson, says the country can expect an increase in rainfall across the island beginning today. He was speaking on Nationwide at 5 on Monday. We are expecting a few days of rain. Actually, starting tomorrow, we are expecting an increase in rainfall. That's because of a trough that's in the area. We are expecting that increase going into Thursday. I believe it will peak somewhere nearer to Thursday, more of the rain, and then it will dissipate going into the weekend or we get back to what I suppose would be normal at this time. But we really are moving into May, and this is usually the time when we should look forward to receiving more rainfall. And the outlook is that things will gradually be changing, and we'll be moving from drought gradually between now on June until we start to see rainfall amounts that may even be above normal. The island continues to grapple with drought conditions amid rising heat. According to the Med Service, a trough in the Central Caribbean is set to produce unstable weather conditions. The trough is expected to last for the next few days. During this period, Jamaicans can expect an increase in cloudy conditions with showers and thunderstorms, especially in eastern parishes. Mr. Thompson says the impact of climate change has resulted in longer periods of drought along with increased rainfall. From time to time, the drought would occur for a period of the year and then it would be broken, the water mm -hmm. would be replenished in whether it's in the aquifers or, you know, generally with our rivers, even those that are really fed by the direct rainfall. So we've been getting rain, but it really is following the trend that was projected for climate change. Mm -hmm. We are seeing longer drought periods. We're seeing more intense droughts and we're seeing the downpours with the rain that are producing some amounts of flooding. So that's really going to be the trend until we can reverse this whole climate change scenario. Evan Thompson, Principal Director of the Met Service. Meanwhile, Minister with Responsibility for Water, Senator Matthew Samuda, says the outcome of discussion of discussions from Jamaica's first national climate forum will assist in guiding the government's plan to combat climate change. We look forward to the discussions that will no doubt take place. We look forward to the basis of planning for the government to streamline its investments to ensure you have the tools that you need to better advise us. That WRA has the tools to digitize its monitoring network. That all of the agencies that touch our planning mechanisms have the tools. But we need to know what we're facing. Senator Samuda was speaking at the opening ceremony for the Jamaica National Stakeholder Consultation on Climate Services and the first National Climate Forum on Monday. He says Jamaica's water sector will need an investment of over 3 billion US dollars or almost 470 billion Jamaican dollars over the next six years in order to achieve water resilience. Governments like Jamaica, which have developmental challenges, you'll always have pressures on your education sector, on your infrastructure, on your farming sector, on your health sector, also now have to prioritize investments and especially collaborations on building our predictive capacity, on building our scientific capacity. Ultimately, we need to be able to assess our current climatic realities if we are to better plan, if we are to insist and ensure that our infrastructure meets the needs that we need it to. Senator Matthew Samuda, Minister with Responsibility for Water. The president of the Jamaica Teachers Association, JTA Leighton Johnson, is welcoming the recommendation to establish school-based dispute resolution centers. He believes that course of action would be most efficient if supported by the deployment of more guidance counselors in schools. Abigail Bartley reports. The recommendation to establish school-based dispute resolution centers was made by the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, in response to ongoing violence in the nation's schools. The PSOJ proposed that these centers be integrated within guidance counseling units and the offices of deans of discipline. 
The organization also recommended that the centers be staffed by conflict resolution professionals. The JTA president is welcoming the recommendations, but Leighton Johnson says some of these mechanisms already exist in schools. The suggestion made for conflict resolution centers within our schools, the guidance counselors, the deans of discipline, they are already doing this. Of course, what we want is additional manpower to assist in the process. So, of course, the implementation or the deployment of conflict resolution specialists in our schools, this is something that our schools would welcome to assist or complement what is already being done. Mr. Johnson says the current student-to-guidance counselor ratio in schools is 500 to 1. According to him, this is untenable. There has to be that comprehensive review of the ratio of guidance counselors to students, and we are recommending anywhere between 250 to 300 students to a guidance counselor. Indeed, there is the need for additional guidance counselors within our school. The issue, as you said, many of these incidents play out at school or in the vicinity, but it doesn't necessarily uh, have its genesis at school. The community is the home, and that's where we all need to target. Mr. Johnson notes that schools are required to report incidents of violence to the Ministry of Education on a monthly basis. He says this data could be used to develop a more targeted approach to violence in schools. If we are analyzing the data from these logs, then we will see from a school the number of fights that took place within a month, mm -hmm. um, where these fights took place, among whom or the students who were involved, whether male or female. It tells the communities that these students come from. So this information is collated at the school. We now need to use this information to ensure as best as possible we target so uh, the intervention required. Abigail Bartley for Nationwide News. Meanwhile, the JTA president says more school resource officers, including social workers, need to be deployed across the country. The community and the home. It makes no sense if at the school there is an intervention and then the students go back into a, an environment that continues to promote and promulgate violence. And in many instances, this is what we see happening. So it has to be a little more than just an intervention at school. It has to be a community-based intervention, and it has to be a home-based intervention. Leighton Johnson, JTA President. International news now. Four law enforcement officers were fatally shot and four others were wounded while serving an arrest warrant in Charlotte, North Carolina. A suspected attacker was found dead in the front yard of a barricaded home after a standoff that lasted three hours. Two other persons of interest were taken in for questioning. It is one of the deadliest assaults on U.S. law enforcement in recent years. The officers were part of a U.S. Marshals Service-led task force. The warrant they were attempting to serve on Monday was against a felon wanted for illegally possessing and well for illegally possessing a firearm. Gunfire erupted on the suburban streets as they tried to do so. The officers returned fire at an assailant in the front yard, then more shots were fired at them from inside the home. A high powered rifle was found inside the property. The dead suspect was later identified as thirty nine year old Terry Clark Hughes Junior, who was wanted for possession of firearm by a felon. Charlotte's mayor, V. Lyles, called on the city to honor the legacy of these slain policemen. The most that I can ask of our community is that we honor and respect them for all the work that they've done, all the work that we will do to make it possible for our city to be safer. Every one of us wants to be in a situation where they got you get up this morning and get to come back home. And someone didn't today. V. Lyles, Charlotte's mayor. 